This is Duke University. Hello, my name is Miriam Cook. I'm the director of the Duke University Middle East Studies Center and the co-organizer of the um, Glo Rethinking Global Cities Conference that is beginning today with our keynote speaker and um, professor from the University of California in Berkeley, um, Professor Nazara Sayed. Welcome to Duke. Thank it's you so much. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, I'd first of all like to talk a little bit about the, your career. You have traveled the world. You've received awards from around the world. You've just come back from a totally exhausting trip that took you to Uganda and Sudan and Egypt for your current book. And I was wondering, let's start from today and then peel back. Very good. Um, well, the trip <laughs> that you're referring to is actually a trip that I took uh, basically uh, originally up the Nile, but then uh, part of it had to be down the Nile. <laughs> uh, and I say that because the Nile is very difficult uh, to travel, in fact. Uh, I'm doing a book for Harvard University Press called Nile, Ur Urban Histories on the Banks of River. Um, and it is a book uh, that is mainly concerned with uh, the cities that appeared and disappeared on the course of the Nile mm -hmm. throughout its 6,000 years of inhabited history. Uh, so in that book, I'm actually covering quite a lot of cities that no longer exist. They only exist as ruins. Uh, some cities that were born out of very specific events, wars or floods. Um, and uh, I felt it's necessary, even though uh, as a historian, uh, I am still dealing mainly with history and archaeology in the writing of this book, uh, that I need to go and see for myself many of these amazing places. So that's exactly what I've been doing for the past month and a half. Very exciting. So how <coughs> does this work on disappeared cities, reappearing cities on the banks of the Nile, how does that connect with the work that you've been doing for decades now on heritage, um, architecture, um, that I have noted in your work, you talk about heritage, you talk about traditional, you talk about vernacular. How, does, how do these three terms connect with each other and with your current work? Uh, this is actually a, a very interesting and very difficult question for me to address, partly because I've spent almost the last 25 years of my career dealing with the subject of tradition. Um, I am uh, educated uh, as an architect. Uh, my PhD was in urban history. Uh, my master's was in urban planning. Uh, so I, I moved between disciplines, if you will. Uh, in the end, I found myself more interested in cities. Uh, hence, mm. I usually describe myself more as an urbanist, someone who does cities, who loves cities, um, good or bad, uh, yeah. uh, you know, easy cities and difficult cities. Um, and hence, Quite a lot of my engagements have been with uh, urbanism. Now, my other engagement uh, with the subject of tradition goes back to um, the mid-80s um, at the University of California at Berkeley. I helped co-found an association called the International Association for the Study of Traditional Environments, hmm. uh, which now has uh, members from all over the world. Um, and it is an association of architects, planners, conservationists, uh, anthropologists, uh, geographers, who are all interested in this thing we call tradition. Now, tradition is a very difficult subject, and it's a very complex uh, uh, word. In fact, the word itself does not exist in many languages. The word, as we use it in the English language, yeah. uh, has equivalence, but not necessarily something that describes what we mean, if you will, by it here. So tradition is, in a sense, what is passed from one generation to another. Mm. Uh, whether it is social practices, uh, customs and habits, uh, or in my case, in the case of what I study, uh, aspects of the built environment that people relate to and consider part of who they are. Uh, it is how the built environment contributes to the making of people's identity. So, of course, the inevitable question, speaking to an Egyptian architect, um, student of architecture um, is to the famous, famous Egyptian architect, um, 
So Hassan Fathi, was he a teacher of yours? Do you admire him? Do you want to, are you killing the father? <laughs> Uh, Hassan Fathi is an extremely important character in both architectural theory um, and I would even argue in architectural practice in the context of the Middle East and in Egypt in particular. He built very little, yet he became extremely influential, ironically, not during his lifetime, but rather after his death. Uh, I think his being awarded the Chairman's Award by the Aga Khan Award for uh, Architecture was one of the main reasons that people started to pay attention to him. Hassan Fathi was always after um, and, and partly because of where he grew up, how he was educated, he spoke perfect French, he spoke perfect mm. English, uh, was commissioned to do this uh, uh, new village called Gorna in Upper Egypt. A project uh, that if it were happening today, we would actually talk about it as uh, architectural engagement with social activism, designing right. for the urban poor. Hence his book was Architecture for the Poor. Um, but in reality, not only did the project really fail, but over time it became very clear that what Hassan Fathi was much more interested in was being able to establish himself as a theorist more among mm -hmm. his Western peers than to influence the architectural profession in Egypt itself. So he had very, very little impact on architectural practice in Egypt um, until yeah. I would say <coughs> the 1990s. Now things changed after he won the Aga Khan Award, partly because um, what Hassan Fathi managed to do uh, brilliantly, uh, although not necessarily intentionally, uh, he managed to distill principles of uh, Islamic architecture of Cairo, and particularly of a very specific style of Islamic architecture in Cairo, the Mamluk style, and reapply it in the making of new forms in Gorna and in other places in some of the few projects that he built. Over time, this particular style was picked up by many of his students I see. and was replicated in uh, new communities, was replicated particularly in resorts and in hotels. Mm. Um, and it became identified not only with Hassan Fathi, but rather with Egypt itself. So if I were certainly to credit Hassan Fathi with anything, it would be uh, for inventing literally a new style of architecture uh, that can give an architectural identity to Egyptian architecture at this moment. Of course, a lot of people do not subscribe to the style and many people categorically reject it. Uh, but there's no doubt that it raises the question, can an architect invent a national style? And I think what Hassan Fathi did was exactly that. And isn't this exactly what's happening in the Arab Gulf, in these um, places like Doha and Dubai and Abu, Abu Dhabi Dhabi. and Sharjah, this heritage engineering? Yes. Uh, again, this is a beautiful question. I think what's happening in the Gulf today is similar, but it's also very different. Uh, partly because what uh, the rulers of Gulf states um, have decided is while they're really truly interested in heritage and culture, and particularly the maintenance of very specific traditions of their peoples, uh, they are also very much interested in putting themselves on the map. Right. And doing so required them to hire some of the top architects of the world from wherever they are, from France, from Italy, from Germany, from the UK, from the United States, to build uh, ostentatious projects, projects that have absolutely nothing uh, or very little at best to do with the physical environment uh, in which they are building. Uh, this is defining a new style of architecture altogether for the Gulf, one which is sort of too soon for us to judge. It mm. will take some time before these projects are accepted for many of the people of these countries, uh, this form of architecture is completely alien. Not only is the architecture itself alien, but even the activities and the functions that they house is alien. Perhaps this is the way that many of the Gulf, rule, Gulf state rulers will be able to uh, uh, you know, bring a degree of difference to their uh, societies. Uh, we will have to wait and see. What does it mean for the Louvre to be in Abu Dhabi? Yeah. Um, how can you have <coughs> Uh, all of these amazing renaissance or modern uh, images uh, which include nudity in a culture where nudity is categorically not allowed. Uh, these are very interesting questions and I think questions that only time will tell how they will be resolved. So in your career you have <coughs> looked at many, many cities, you have thought about the traditions, you've thought about modernity, 
and you've had many, many students. What would you like your legacy to be? What do you hope that your students are, are going to do that is in some ways going to be marked by you? Well, one of the things that I have uh, uh, labored very much to, to teach, particularly to my PhD students, uh, that one has to love what one really does. Uh, uh, one has to be very sure. much involved with the subject of one's own inquiry. Uh, that one's influence is not necessarily only a product uh, of the books that one actually writes, but rather of the method or the approach uh, that, that one innovates, if possible. Uh, so for example, um, you know, the teaching and the writing of architectural history until the 1960s and 70s was very much dominated by chronology. Um, as an urban historian and an architectural historian, uh, I also practiced in this specific vein. Um, in the 80s, uh, new uh, approaches to architectural history that focused on comparative analysis and more specifically on the idea of not seeing history linearly also were innovated, uh, and I participated in that. Uh, however, there were still problems because in a sense taking history outside of its chronological context is very, very difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, and being able to compare two cities in the world exactly at the same time but that belong to two different cultures altogether uh, is not necessarily either an easy endeavor nor is it something that results in some conclusions. So, so I believe in an approach uh, today uh, that history is always told from the present that there is no history that is independent of ideology. Who we are, what we know, what we believe in, not only influences what we write, but it is something that we should not hide, but rather be proud of, as long as we declare it so that it's very clear from what perspective it's written from. So, so for me, uh, I, I think that history is not just simply the sum of everything that was said and done. It is the sum of everything that was said and done as it is uh, reconnected, uh, rediscovered, or narrated by particular individuals at specific points in time with very specific positions and ideologies. So with that in mind, can you give us a brief preview of your keynote tonight? Cairo after Tahrir, the revolution. Uh, yes, uh, my, my main concern, I have, I have always been fascinated with Cairo and uh, it's a city uh, in which I lived uh, as a child, uh, and it is the city in which I was born. Um, uh, but Cairo for me, however, is a very complex city. So I'll, I'll tell you a very short anecdote as a way of uh, uh, ending this conversation. Um, before the uh, so-called revolution in 2011, I was sitting with a group of friends, um, and they were all talking about how bad things are in Cairo. So one of them uh, said, you know, the city is like a bomb. It is about to explode at any time. Another, in the same gathering, we're all sitting drinking coffee, some of them even smoking shisha, uh, said, you know, Cairo is just like a tomb. It is so old with everything in it that is so rotten. Uh, a third uh, of our friends who sort of the joker in the group said, no, no, no. Cairo is actually both. It is a bomb inside a tomb and the bomb has exploded, and what we are all living through today is basically the remains of this tomb that is now scattered around the landscape. That is what is left of Cairo. I actually found this analogy, which was made as a joke, to be very powerful that I used it uh, in the introduction of my book on Cairo, Histories of City, which came out a couple of years ago. Um, so when the revolution happened, and I always put revolution in quotes, I have to say I was not completely surprised. I was surprised by the uh, veracity of the demonstrations and I was surprised by the, um, you know, the, the fact that almost everybody of every walk of life was now suddenly very supportive of it, uh, although many of them regret it today. Um, and, and in a sense, I, I think that uh, what happened in Cairo during those 18 days, which is the main subject of my talk uh, today, tells us quite a lot about media. It tells us quite a lot about social movements. Uh, and it tells us a lot about the relationship between social media, uh, about the situations in urban space in this age of globalization, where people do not necessarily live only in physical places, but they are so well connected 
through the internet, through Twitter, through Facebook, uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, and in a sense, this may be uh, not totally new. It happened before in 89 in Tiananmen Square. We seem to have forgotten it. The new media at the time was actually CNN. Uh, mm. It did not exist. CNN was almost made at the time of Tiananmen Square and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Today, the new media is Facebook and Twitter. And in a sense, that new media is what was used uh, by the demonstrators in Tahrir Square. So my talk will also expand a little bit on that, looking at other Tahrir Squares in other cities, mainly in the Arab world. Well, thank you very much. And we're very much looking to Looking forward to your talk tonight. Thank you, Miriam. It's a pleasure.